Oh, it's real. And it's, uh, and it's the, the response, the global response has been fascinating for us, like interest from, from, from countries that I didn't even think um, would show up for a number of years. Uh, there's, there's so much initiative and, and food security. I mean, we don't feel it so much in North America in the same way that many, many other parts of the world do. Uh, and there's so much more vulnerability to um, um, to food supply. So uh, again, lots and lots of interest coming in from um, the continent of Africa, for instance, and and throughout Europe. And of course, Europe has been suffering dramatically because of the the war in Ukraine and and uh, supply of of natural gas specifically, but also um, fertilizer supply, um, most of which comes from Ukraine and Russia. Uh, interestingly, uh, is, has all but uh, has all but dried up. So that means that yields go down dramatically, cost goes up dramatically, uh, and and food insecurity is is rampant globally. We haven't even seen the tip of it yet. This is the Alden Report. Folks, before we get into our next guest, I'm super excited about our latest program. Look, we've been on television for close to 20 years, literally selling hundreds of millions of dollars with products and services that have had a positive impact on people's lives. We've created millionaires. If you've ever watched television, you've most likely seen me on television, not dressed like this, but in a suit and a tie. Listen, we've re-engineered the process. We're allowing people, a small group of people, whether you're an author, whether you're a business coach, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you have a program or a service that you feel as though that can have a positive impact on people's lives and you want to up-level your game, you know, you're tired of what's going on on social media, you're tired of AI is not kicking in, you're tired of all the money that you're spent and you're not seeing any return. You're tired of all these fraudsters out there that tell you they're going to put you in Huffington Post or USA Today or Forbes and it's nothing just but a joke. You want to be in front of millions of people every single day all over the country. Folks, we've been doing it for 20 years. We've re-engineered the process. We've made it possible for the average everyday person to participate in this. If you want to up-level your game, if you truly want to build your profile, if you truly want to get in front of millions of people every single day, Send me a direct message at Mike Alden 2012. You'll see it on the bottom of the screen at Mike Alden 2012 and put TV in the message. And I will get back to you personally and see if you're a good fit for us. Again, send me a direct message at Mike Alden 2012. Send me the message TV and we'll see if you're a good fit. This is the Alden Report. Right. My name is Mike Alden. We are here in Blue Bay Studios. You know, I'm not rocking my 99 cent glasses. I'm actually rocking fairly expensive readers uh, because I'm at that point now where I need to read stuff and I can't read them without them. So uh, I'm super excited for my next guest. He's going to be talking about a subject that I don't know. Maybe you've heard about it. Maybe some people are talking about it. What's happening with the environment? Is stuff really happening with the environment? Is the ozone layer really a mess? Is, are our oceans really polluted? Are, is you know those images of the big giant uh, almost islands full of uh full of waste and plastic is that real like what's really going on are the are the sea levels really rising are the glaciers actually truly melting at a, at a pace is the temperature in the earth really rising you know we hear this all the time and there's, there's both sides of it right i'm a, i'm kind of a believer in science so uh he's going to be here to talk not only about, about what's going on but what he's doing about it and he's been doing it uh, for, uh, geez, I think close to 20 years. Please help me welcome Ian Clifford. Ian, thanks so much for being here. Hey, Mike. It's great to be here. Thanks. So um, so you're in Canada. We were just talking uh, offline. Um, let's just get right into it, man. So, you know, again, in my my opening, we, you just it, it seems to be here in the United States is the Republicans think that climate change is a myth. <laughs> and then the Democrats believe, oh, well, it's it's something. Look, I'm here in Massachusetts. And they say, uh, you know, if you don't like the weather, wait a minute. Um, it's November, okay, and it's probably 70 degrees. And um, it's great, but that's not what it's been like over the past 20 years. Uh, and and I'm, so I'm starting to see it here in a, in a state that, you know, is fairly regular as far as our climate, uh, right, in our seasons. But then you're looking at the map in the United States and you look at, you know, Arizona, which has always been, a you know, truly a hot spot in, in, in Vegas. And 
you know, I don't know if you've ever been in Vegas in July. I have. And you walk out and you feel like you're going to spontaneously explode because it's so hot. So let's just start there. Um, give me the facts. Give me the facts of what's actually going on right now over the maybe the past 20, 30 years. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, we could spend hours talking about this. Obviously, I'm sitting north of you in Nova Scotia, Canada, and two weeks ago we had a hurricane. So, uh, which is completely out of character for um, for the east coast of Canada. A very rare event, but now becoming much more um, much more common. So. The climate is changing uh, without question. I mean, it, it, from a scientific perspective, there's no, uh, there is no argument. Um, ocean temperatures are rising. I, ice caps are melting. Uh, Greenland is melting, which is, of course, causing um, uh, causing huge issues in, in ultimately in terms of um, uh, ocean levels and that sort of thing. It's all happening, and from a certainly from a measured perspective over the last century. It all corresponds pretty clearly to the growth of global population and 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 human consumption. So, um, again, we can we could talk for hours about that. I, I think that the things to focus on are the things that we can do about it. You know, where can we facilitate positive change in the way that we do things on Earth to uh, to help mitigate um, to help mitigate this this really crisis situation. Uh, and there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, we as a company, we're, we're very much focused on, today focused on agriculture. Um, agriculture is a, is a huge greenhouse gas emitter, um, both on the animal side of agriculture, but also on the conventional side of, of how we fertilize our crops, um, how, we, um, how we distribute um, the inputs that go into the fields and so on. So fuel positive is really much focused on on how do we help farmers um, mitigate and reduce emissions on the farm. So we're doing that now through a um, a, a modular containerized um, uh, ammonia production, green ammonia production system. So farmers can produce their own uh, fertilizers on farm that are not animal based and are not carbon based um, that allow them to reduce emissions dramatically. Um, and it makes farming much more affordable um, as well, which is which is hugely important. Uh, and it also um, reduces greenhouse gases dramatically. So this is an area um, which is isn't really um, well known by kind of the general general population as being a huge, uh, greenhouse gas emitter. Uh, and we've got to do everything we can to help farmers who feed people <laughs> around the world, um, uh, you know, really reduce emissions so that uh, farming is sustainable into the next, you know, into the coming decades and centuries, because we can't keep doing things the way that we're doing them today. It's just not sustainable. Um, lost your audio there towards the end, but but uh, I, I got what you're saying. Um, so look, there are so many companies out there. I believe your company is a publicly traded company. Uh, there are a lot of uh, individuals out there that are you know trying to to make change. Um, and you know you hear about companies that are that are trying, like for instance, like well here we hear about. Let's talk about electric cars, right? You hear that electric cars allegedly supposed to be good. They're supposed to be better, but then you have this all the school thought, well, you know, you got to plug those things in and you've got to charge them. And those things are really being charged ultimately by some sort of coal production somewhere along the lines, which which in theory actually could be potentially worse for the environment. So it's like, what are we supposed to do? Right. Because, you know, my wife. Right. She is a nut as it relates to recycling. Right. Mm -hmm. And I and I've had the people that that pick up the recycling. They say, you know, this doesn't help any. And I'm like, no, what do you mean? Yeah. They're, like, they're like, it doesn't help any. And then she'll spend, um, you know, a half an hour washing out a piece of plastic because, you know, she's worried that, you know, it won't get properly uh, processed because there might be some residual food or whatever in there. Like that to me is so frustrating because we as human beings forget about what countries we're in. You know, I think we all want to make sure that it's this planet's going to be here for a long time or forever. And we try to do the things that we're supposed to do individually. You're doing it on a kind of a bigger level. Like, what do you say to that stuff like that? Okay, so let's start there. I recycle stuff. 
isn't it? Isn't that supposed to be good for the for the environment? Right. Yeah, it, it is. But you, you've got it. a lot of the systems are are simply broken, right? So you can start looking at things like plastics and 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 realize that there are technologies that exist today to produce biodegradable plastics. For as an example, so suddenly this issue around recycling, which is a really important issue that you're raising, um, there are there are scientific and technological solutions today that simply need to be implemented. The problem is, uh, one of the big problems is you've got a, you've got a century old oil and gas industry that has been feeding, um, feeding our consumption for, for over a century. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't want to change. It wants us to keep utilizing and, 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 uh, and consuming fossil fuels. It's just, that's the nature of that industry. So today we need to look at technologies that can change things uh, at a paradigm shift level. So again, we could, we could eliminate so much um, uh, unrecyclable waste by moving to technologies that are in, in fact biodegradable. So that's just one thing. So this again is a, is a very um, macro solution for a, for a, micro, a micro issue that you're mentioning. And it's frustrating as consumers because I've had the same conversations with the people who pick up our recycling and 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 they say the same thing. Like it's it it is not a well run system in many many locations around the world. And and of course many countries around the world do no recycling whatsoever. So you've got a huge trash issue uh, that exists there. But technology can help. You know, you remove to, you move towards biodegradable. Uh, plastics and and suddenly if if a bottle plastic bottle ends up in landfill it decomposes so these are again technologies that can help along the way again very similar to what we're doing we're using a tech technology a technological solution to fix a hundred year old problem uh, and there are lots and lots of people and companies out there around the world who are looking at just that and you mentioned electric cars you know of course battery technology is one of the the big issues right is where the raw materials coming for batteries. Um, and, and again, those have a huge environmental footprint. So again, lots of exciting work happening in that regard. Even our company, we're working on a solid state uh, battery technology um, that would eliminate uh, those kinds of raw material issues. So uh, by using materials that are readily available around the world that have a, a virtually um, uh, inconsequential environmental footprint, um, and those, again, technology is going to fix things for us. And, and we've got to embrace companies that are doing that kind of work because it's not going to happen. The big companies that are uh, that are century old um, consumers and producers are not the ones who are moving fast enough for the kind of change that we need to to help the environment. And, and I see that same conversation happening everywhere in the world realizing that we've got the technology today to do this, uh, we just have, have to implement it. And then on our website, we quote um, uh, the young Swedish environmentalist Greta Thunberg, who's very controversial in many places in the world, but she says just that. We just, we know what we need to do. We just have to do it. And governments are opposing it and big industry is opposing it. We've just got to find ways to make things happen. So the name, of, the name of your company is Fuel Positive. We're going to get into, you know, what you're doing. I'm looking at, you know, the innovation uh, and the technology that you guys have created. I'm guessing you have probably all sorts of uh, patents uh, surrounding that, and it's pretty neat what you're doing. And I do want to get into that. But again, if, if you're listening up to this point, you're like, what are these guys doing? You just go to fuelpositive.com. You can check out, um, you know, what they're doing. So, um, you know, you mentioned change. I, I had a, a guy on years ago, he, uh, a company it was called Change is Simple. And his whole, um, it's a nonprofit, their whole business uh, was, is they, they teach children actually uh, in schools about sustainability, right? Sure. And I didn't, even, I didn't, honestly didn't even know, I mean, I, I mean, I know what the word means, but I didn't really understand really like what he was talking about, you know, like, sure. you know, like, like, okay, so I have a plastic coffee pepper here and I'm going to throw it away. I'm just being honest, you know, um, and I don't know, well, hold on. I will recycle it. Actually, my wife will recycle it, but it probably uh, is not going to get where it needs to go. Talk right. about sustainability, because uh, because what you're kind of doing as well, you you have built this almost kind of like a uh, an ecosystem, if, if, if for lack of a better term, where where you are kind of almost recycling your own stuff, or at least farmers are. Um, yeah. Talk about sustainability and why that's important for for average everyday people, because because you're doing again stuff that's 
kind of on a bigger scale, which makes sense because it should help more people. But I think a lot of individuals are like, well, what can I do? Like, what, you know, what can I do today if I'm not a farmer? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, and it, it, and sustainability has a lot of different definitions. Um, uh, if you're, again, a, a big petroleum company, sustainability means how do you get people to keep using petroleum, but use less and, and use it for longer because they want, you know, they want to maximize that that process and in terms of the the you know the the cup that you or the disposable cup you held up again if that were made of biodegradable plastics then you would care less as a consumer where it ended up because it would end up biodegrading and 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 not having a negative um a negative environmental footprint so those are the kinds of things that that will make a difference um in terms of what we're doing uh we're trying to help farmers um who feed all of us um become much more secure in their business so um the biggest input for farmers around the world in most situations is fertilizer so they need to fertilize their crops in order to get maximum yield uh, in order to, all, in an ideal situation, feed people as opposed to animals. But but either way, uh, the idea here is that as the population grows, um, the necessity for um, for green and sustainable solutions that allow farmers to feed a growing population around the world uh, become essential. So again, our system is is an on farm system that produces um, green ammonia, which is a, a primary nitrogen fertilizer. Used um, eighty percent of the ammonia produced on the planet every year is is utilized in agriculture as fertilizer, and it's been made for a, over a hundred years. Um, and it's made from it, ammonia today is made from fossil fuel inputs, so it's a it's got a huge carbon footprint. So we, we're saying to farmers. If you have wind power or solar power on your farm uh, and you have one of our systems, you can produce carbon-free green ammonia for decades um, at the same cost and the same supply. Uh, and, and it'll build in not only business security, but environmental security, of course, and food security um, as it as it relates to 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 our solution, uh, and that's a that's a game changer for farmers um, because they are they've been the you know at the the wrong end of the stick if you will as it relates to um, the fertilizer industry and the fossil fuel industry for forever. So this is an opportunity for farmers to stand independent uh, and and produce um, and produce food for us sustainably. And, th and that ties back to your whole question about sustainability. And sustainability, I think, it, it ties in heavily to us as individuals taking control of our consumption. And that makes it, it you know, it, it, one person, it doesn't sound by, uh, like a lot, but you start multiplying that by thousands and millions and ultimately billions of people doing the, even the littlest things that they can um, create massive, massive change. You know, um, when I think about, you know, what you're doing, and I'm looking at it right now, uh, it looks just like kind of like a, a shipping container. That's obviously yeah. it's more it's more than that. And I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about it. But um, I think of adaptation. Right. And I think of farmers and I think of how we've done things. And I and then I even think of things like, you know, now it seems like electric cars are, are kind of, you know, a, everybody gets them now for the most. I mean, every manufacturer is doing it, but there was so much resistance since pretty much since the beginning of time and now all of a sudden you know it's 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 becoming uh you know common and it's becoming in some countries it's going to be you know the law right sure. but when i think about farmers especially here in the united states adaptation you know is there um friction or resistance for your company to go to a farmer and say hey i know you've been doing it like this forever and i know it's been working for you forever and uh you're making money or maybe you're not i don't know but um, to me, I think that's got to be kind of a tough sell, no? Well, yeah, I and and I mean, there's a lot of sectors where change is a really scary word, um, right. and and definitely in farming, uh, change makes people nervous. Um, but you've got to realize what they're up against. So when you talk about change, um, 
uh, fertilizer costs have gone up about 400% over the last 18 months. And that's the major input cost for many, many farmers around the world. So that's change. That's negative change. And, and that's dramatic, right? So, so when we go in with a, with a solution that stabilizes and, and locks in and reduces cost, um, it, it, it's really, it's, it's highly, um, uh, highly well received, as you can imagine. So, our, one of our, our first system is going into a, an eleven thousand acre farm in um, uh, outside of Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, uh, that'll be on farm early uh, early in the new year, probably in January. And the um, the farmer, they're a multi generational farm. So, very uh, to your point, um, you know, they've been doing things the same way for a long time. Uh, they're innovative farmers in the sense that they're very technology driven. Um, so they're they're reducing costs wherever they can, utilizing advanced technologies. But they have been um, such a victim to um, to an, a, a massive industry, the fertilizer industry, that is, has them held at ransom. So we asked the question when we first started talking to them, and we were worried because we thought, you know, that they would feel like they were pariahs or standing out alone or something against the system, something like that. And we asked them, you know, how are you going to be perceived by your neighbors, your friends, your neighbor farmers in this context? Because, you know, you're doing something that is is truly disruptive. And they said, we'll be seen as heroes. And to us, that was a remarkable statement because we thought it would be the opposite. Like, we're really nervous. You know, we're we're kind of crossing boundaries here. And they said, no, we've been we've been held ransom for for forever. And now we are standing, you know, standing free and strong and independent. And our neighbors are going to love that. And And farmers. You know, farmers are it's it's a it's a social sell. So you're you're talking to them about the benefits. You're talking about them about everything that they do on their farm. But ultimately, you know, once one system is on farm, then they'll talk to ten neighbors, and those ten neighbors will get systems, and then that it'll be on ten more farms and a hundred more farms, and and that's how it will that's how it'll progress. And we know that. Um, so it starts small, but it it uh, it is almost expon it is exponential in terms of growth as as we advance. So uh, so we'll you know we start sitting here going you know well what is one farm gonna what difference is that gonna make? Well you know it's a, a number of tons of CO two emissions per year, so it's it is significant. But you start multiplying that by by again by tens, by hundreds, by thousands, um, by hundreds of thousands around the world, uh, and suddenly you've You've reinvented a hundred-year-old um, way of of fertilizing crops, and you've made it um, uh, to use the word sustainable, um, uh, absolutely sustainable for decades and 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 potentially generations. It'll be a new way of of farming in that context. When I think of um, verticals, you know, in business, I've been in business for a long time. I'm always thinking about the different ways that we can, you know, take what we're doing and, and, and introduce that to a different kind of market. And, you know, you talked about, um, you know, uh, food production so that we can feed ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, in Canada, uh, cannabis is federally legal. Uh, in the United States, uh, it's it's pretty much almost there. Uh, you think you have like 30 or 40 states where it's legal to some uh, to some degree. And um, and then you know, CBD was a big thing for a while. And a lot of these farmers, and because we're here in New England, and you, um, you, a lot of these farmers converted from corn or even cow corn uh, to, to hemp, right? Absolutely. And, and I think about that industry and what they're doing and their progressive nature and who just, yeah. just who that community is, right? And, 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 and uh, most of them are, in fact, concerned about all the stuff we're talking about. They also want to make sure that their product is. Um, is safe uh, and and organic and the same. Um, do you do you see a big vertical? Do you see that that, that those types of farms uh, could, or would be maybe a um, an easier door to crack open versus some guy who's been you know growing wheat uh, in his family for the past hundred years? So you no, know, it's a it, it's actually a great question and it's a really good it's a really good segue because what you're talking about is. Uh, what's called a controlled environment agriculture. So these are our greenhouses and vertical farms and that sort of thing. And as climate change, um, as climate gets more severe, 
then the idea of growing things indoors um, in a controlled environment becomes a lot more attractive and a lot more sustainable. So, um, so the quick answer is absolutely. Um, uh, hemp and um, cannabis are, are huge consumers of nitrogen. They, they require a lot of nitrogen to grow so um, and to grow as healthy plants. So uh, our systems are perfect for that because they need a continual feed and we produce, uh, we produce uh, nitrogen and fertilizer continuous, continuously. So it's it's perfect. And so we're talking to a lot of uh, different um, controlled environment farmers now um, about that. And, and it's it's an easier sell in the sense that it's it's highly technical, right? That type of farming is extremely technical. And our system is a you know is a is a little factory, if you will, to produce um to produce those outputs. Um so it is, yeah, no, it is, and it's very much the future. We're seeing that all over the world. Um we're seeing areas, uh, you go to the Middle East and you go to uh, to, to many areas in Africa now um, where they're looking seriously at a controlled environment so that they can can grow healthy food locally um, for to feed to feed their communities instead of importing food from, you know, uh, from Europe, for instance. So and, and Ukraine is a perfect example of how important this is. I mean, you, the wheat from Ukraine feeds a lot of Africa. And of course, now the, the wheat crop has been decimated. Um, and their fertilizer infrastructure has been decimated because they have only a few um, large fertilizer production facilities that, of course, have been um, um, damaged or shut down because of this horrible war. And you, you're in a situation where um, not only is it a desperate situation for the farmers in Ukraine, but the people who are receiving and, and supposed to be eating that that out that produce are are suffering dramatically as a result as well. So. If you imagine somewhere like Ukraine, if they had, if farmers had, you know, thousands and thousands of our systems, instead of relying on massive centralized production, um, it would it'd be a completely different situation. So that's when you start thinking about what does the future look like over the coming decades, um, our method, our business model of decentralized production uh, is very, very important. And it's important on all sorts of things. I mean, it's important on the grid. It's important how we consume and produce um, fuels and energy. Um, all of these things, the more decentralized we get, the more security we have, um, the, the safer our infrastructure is, the more secure our infrastructure is. So, so de for, for us, decentralization is a, is a, is a buzzword for, uh, for many, many vertical, um, uh, many, many vertical opportunities. So, um, so we see that very much as the future as well. And then second, I want to talk to you about the business model, uh, how it works, uh, other subsidies, what is it going to cost a farmer? How long does it take? Uh, how scalable is it? How quickly, uh, you know, from from you know signing a contract, will this thing be delivered and, and actually working in just a second? Folks, again, we're on with Ian Clifford. He's the CEO and founder of a company called Fuel Positive. If you've been listening up until this point, you can tell, as we would say from Boston, this guy's wicked smart, as we would say. Um, you know, he, he's... Uh, his entire life, actually, uh, he's been uh, concerned about the environment. And, you know, a lot of people don't find their, quote, passion. Uh, this guy found it pretty early, and he's been doing it a long time. And he's ultimately trying to save humanity, you know, your kids, your kids' kids, and those kids' kids, so. right? <laughs> trying to yeah. save the planet. And that's what he's doing. And, and you know what? I just know, I, I know this industry to a certain degree. And I tell you right now, he's not getting rich doing it, at least not now. Uh, and, you know, he's working extremely hard at the end of the day to um, sustain humanity here on the planet so if you'd like some more information about ian and his company and what he's doing you just go to fuelpositive.com they also are traded on a couple of exchanges you go to their website fuelpositive.com you can take a look at what they're doing if you like what they're doing if you want to support what they're doing you know i'm not a financial advisor take a look at you know all the stuff you're supposed to look at and if you feel comfortable with what they're doing and you want to support it feel free to go ahead and, and become an investor uh in the company um if, if it's available to you so um Let's talk about the business for a second. So what I see is, and I'm on your website, to me, mm -hmm. it looks like a kind of like a storage container uh, that is, uh, you know, the way I'm describing it, it has like its own little ecosystem in there. So let's yeah. just, um, I'm going to try and simplify it for a second. Let's start with, I'm going to go back to my cannabis one. So let's say you have, you, you've got a big cannabis producer in Canada, because it's federally mm -hmm. legal, uh, and they say, you know what, we're willing to do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sign a contract, we're good to go. Um, give me the the numbers if you can. What does it cost um, the like the the farmer 
um, and uh, what is the the speed in which you can deliver it, um, and and really how scalable is it, right? So let's you, you talked earlier about word of mouth, right? That's how just the world works. So this yeah. farmer says, oh yeah, and then before you know it, now all of a sudden you get fifty orders, and that's a great thing, but it could also be a bad thing. Um, so tell me about that. Let's talk about the business. Sure. So um, I, actually, I'll use uh, I'll use the example of the farm that will be receiving our first system. So it's a it's a pilot project in the sense that um, it's a pre-production system. Uh, it's much more robust than a and and heavily heavily monitored and so on. So it's it's a it's a really decked out system, if you will. Um, they'll be receiving that uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, it'll be running on their farm in Manitoba um, uh, through the next year. Um, we'll be gaining a tremendous amount of knowledge and data um, just environmentally. Uh, Manitoba goes from the most extreme cold to the, the very, very hot and 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 everything in between flooding and 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 blizzards and everything else. So it's a great test bed for us. And they're really familiar with the output. Um, they use, They've been using anhydrous ammonia as, as nitrogen fertilizer for decades. So they're a great model for us. Um, the system that we're putting on their farm, it, it produces about 100 metric tons a year of anhydrous ammonia that's then stored uh, right where it's produced. Um, that would that fertilizes about 2,000 acres of, of a, a traditional crop like wheat, um, uh, uh, wheat or uh, canola, something like that. Um, and this farm, as I said, was 11,000 acres. So at the end of the day, they're going to need multiple systems. Um, so our, our technology is designed to scale. Um, very importantly, we can scale up and down. Uh, but for a farm like that, they'll probably end up with six or seven systems um, by the time uh, we're done with them to provide their uh, to provide their their need. Um, we could in our production capacity today, uh, it would take about two years to produce that many systems because we're just now set up for just small batch manufacturing. But we started pre-sales uh, a couple of months ago in August, and we've had a phenomenal response from all over the world. So our intention is to scale up and, and go to very automated production of our technology in Canada. Um, one of the reasons we're building on a 20-foot container footprint is that it's very easy for us to ship our systems, um, whether it's, you know, down the road or around the world. Um, very, very, uh, very, very friendly in terms of, uh, of locating our technology anywhere that it's needed. So um, in terms of cost, uh, one system is about just under a uh, million dollars Canadian. Um, and that produces, as I said, about 100 metric tons of, of fertilizer per year. Right, let, me stop. Um, let me stop you there. Let me yeah. stop you there. It's a big number. That's uh, I don't know. I don't know what the uh, the current uh, kind of conversion is here in the States, but let's just stay with a million. With a million, you asked me, you know, right. So that's a big yeah. number. Um, yeah. how, 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 how's the farmer paying for it? Well, they again. They it depends on the type of farm that you're dealing with, and and our initial farm, uh, our pilot farm in Manitoba, um, they have millions and millions and millions of dollars invested in infrastructure. So they've got you know half a dozen combines at a million dollars each. They've got a grain handling facility. They're they're a big sophisticated commercial operation, family run operation. Um, and they're spending millions of dollars on fertilizers every year anyhow as input. So what we're providing for them is, is supply and cost security. Our systems will last several decades uh, at least. Um, so it's a very robust piece of technology. So does it get to a point, so does it get to a point where it pays for itself and then some? Is that is that, oh, yeah. that really oh. the sexy part? Oh no, absolutely no, and that's the key, that's the key part of this as well for the farmers who are considering the business case. Um, we produce uh, in Manitoba. Our system would produce um, a ton of 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 um, anhydrous green ammonia for about a little over five hundred dollars a ton. Uh, today, a farmer is paying about twenty four hundred dollars per ton, uh, and the price may 
it may normalize down to about $1,500 a ton. Farmers never think they're going to see less than $1,000 a ton um, again. So already out of the gate, they've got a massive savings in terms of, uh, in terms of operating cost um, and, and output um, value. So, uh, and you got to remember ammonia, gray ammonia that's been produced over the last century is a commodity type um, material and its price goes all over the place, right? So um, what we're saying to farmers is you have our system on farm uh, and you can stabilize your cost of, a, of something that's a, a variable commodity price for decades, right? You can lock it in. And if you put solar on your farm to power your system, uh, and this particular farm ha has a large solar um, solar array, and they're increasing their solar uh, capability on farm. They, they'll be able to run our system off grid, which means they don't even need to connect into into the electrical grid um, a, that uh, in their area. Which means they'll reduce their cost um, even more dramatically. They'll be able to produce a ton of ammonia for say two hundred and fifty dollars um, for the next thirty years. So it, this is what I'm saying. It's it's a it's a disruptive shift, uh, and it's the kind of shift that that has to happen. We've got to give that level of security to farmers so that we can uh, help them. You know, not only have a secure business, but also produce food for people uh, in the decades um, and ultimately centuries to come this is a this is about a as as i said earlier about a it is really about a paradigm shift in 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 the single most expensive input on a on a typical farm um you so that's how it looks oh uh, i'm sorry I, I, I cut you off i'm sorry no no it's okay so no that's very much how it looks um we plan based on uh certainly based on our our pre-sales numbers that are coming in now that we will go to mass production um and we're already planning for it through 2023. So, uh, and we're looking, you know, how best to finance that. We've got tremendous support federally in Canada and provincially in Canada as well. This is a made in Canada technology. So there's a huge amount of interest um, from the from our government to support this, not only for farmers in Canada, but ultimately to export this technology around the world. Well, I got a lot of, more questions to ask. Um, so, sure. you, uh, well, let's just go with kind of what you just uh, went with. So, subsidies, right? So, you know, um, the United States subsidizes the farmers. They've been doing it since the beginning of time, pretty much. Um, yeah. Which, which artificially kind of controls the pricing, and people, you know, we, we could go down that rabbit hole. But, um, uh, but here in the United States, I'm guessing the same in Canada. You know, even down to the average uh, individual, you know, we're incentivized to have you know, you know, uh, more cost efficient or fuel efficient or energy efficient equipment. You know, if we have windows that are that are going to keep the heat in and the cool in and we're going to get some sort of tax incentive. Uh, do you envision that uh, you'll have uh, government subsidies involved involved in this? I know you said that they're interested, but have they said, hey, you know what, we'll be willing to uh, kind of give you some sort of rebate back or, or the farmer a rebate back for using this? whether it's whether it's annualized or on a single on a single payment i'm just curious if that's well, been discussed one of the neat things is we're we're taking an incredibly carbon intense manufacturing process in gray ammonia so ammonia is today is made in like oil refineries in huge huge facilities uh, and then it's trans and and it uses fossil fuel to produce ammonia and then it's transported all over the world so there's a there's a massive carbon footprint when you manufacture it and then there's a huge carbon footprint when you transport it around so um so one of the big things that is built into our technology is the fact that we're decarbonizing a, a carbon intense technology, uh, which means that it's uh, it's completely uh, viable and available for carbon credits. So that's part of the potential um, rebate uh, capability as, as, as farmers produce, our systems produce tons and tons of, of carbon offsets um, that those have value. So that's one that's one mechanism. We don't talk to farmers about that today because it's the economics just given the current cost of fertilizers and the savings that they would receive on our system using our systems, the return on investment is 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 dramatically fast based on where we are today. So it's not a hard sell in in terms of uh, in terms of the economics. Um, 
However, you know, we want to see farmers uh, being able to put, you know, large solar on farm, um, uh, wind power on farm specifically to run this technology, our technology that, and that would be great for rebates because you're, again, you're decentralizing, you're taking massive loads off the grid, um, you're making things safer and more efficient, and you're building in food security. And we think that farmers should be rewarded for, for taking those steps, quite honestly, and it should be as made as easy financially as easy as possible, because everyone benefits. Um, the, the, the consumer at the end of the, of the food chain, if you will, um, will benefit because we'll have security around um, many and many of the lots and lots of the crops that are grown around the world. And that's huge. So no longer will natural gas prices around the world, uh, the huge fluctuations or its lack of supply um, have ultimately a huge negative effect on the cost of food um, to the consumer. So we can stabilize those things. That's the whole idea here was we're trying to create a very, uh, a very stable environment um, that has never existed for farmers in that context. So a little bit more about the business. Uh, we don't have a ton of time left. Again, uh, we've been on with Ian Clifford. He's the CEO and founder of a company called Fuel Positive. And man, if you've been listening up until this point, you got to be somewhat excited about what he's doing uh, because it, it is innovative. Uh, it is uh, progressive and it uh, uh, has a chance to not only uh, save humanity, uh, but also uh, save us money, too. That's the other part, too. We haven't really talked too much about that. But, um, okay, so you are a, a publicly traded company. What what exchanges are you guys on? Uh, we're on the Toronto Stock Exchange uh, Venture Exchange, and we're on the, um, in the U.S., we're on the OTC yeah. Okay. UB. Yeah. So, so, um, so. You know, there are obviously, you, you know, it being a CEO, there, there are certain things that you need to do, your requirements, and a lot of these things are public. So um, right now, you guys are essentially pre-revenue. You've raised, I believe, $75 million. Uh, I'm guessing, again, just, let's just go with U.S. for, for now. Um, and so you pre-revenue. You said you had some pre-sales. What does 2023 really look like for you for revenue? I'm guessing you're probably not going to be profitable for several years. But what is the, what does the revenue uh, look like? And then last question is... Um, uh, how much more money do you need to raise in order to make sure that you as a business are sustainable and have a long, a long enough runway to, to ultimately, um, you know, get to uh, the end result? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it, there's a lot of variables in there, but um, uh, as a public company, we have access to capital through, obviously through the capital markets. We've got um, a lot of very good institutional shareholders who support uh, and have supported the the company over the over the years, um, and most recently, um, uh, some very strong U.S. institutional investors uh, who have supported the company as well. Um, as a pre-revenue company, we've got to you know we watch our dollars, but we also have to make sure that we've got enough capital to get to profitability, uh, and that's essential. So um, we either raise money in the in the uh, sorry in the public markets through private placements. So we work with accredited investors and and provide investment opportunity in that context. Um, we also have today now that we're just about to launch uh, our first uh, uh, pre-commercial systems or, or commercial grade systems. Um, we have a lot of interest, uh, funding interest from both federal and provincial governments uh, in Canada. Uh, specifically. So that'll help. I, and they'll fund up to 75% of CapEx cost as it relates to building out these technologies. So that's very generous. And um, it's not immediate money, but it's money that we can bank on once uh, once we get those approvals. So we've got a number of large applications in today that will ultimately, um, certainly uh, in a non-dilutive way, help support, uh, support our development. Uh, and then the big question is, how quickly do we ramp up Commercialize uh, commercialization and automated manufacturing, and our, our chief ex, uh, chief operating officer and and much of our our technical team have tremendous experience in in scaling up manufacturing. So they've built systems in the past for uh, for Tesla, for Toyota, um, for some of the large food processing companies. So they know how to build, we know, our team knows how to build and ramp very, very quickly um, from just batch manufacturing today to automated, uh, fully automated robotic manufacturing in the future. Um, so again, 
if pre-sales keep coming in the level that they are now um, through 2023, we will start moving to very large facilities with automation. And then in 2024, have, um, have what I would consider mass production, which would be potentially one or two systems a day. Uh, and again, that's that's uh, that's that would be very 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 significant milestone for us, and and would be all about profitability in that case for the company. One last question: uh, You said pre-sales. Uh, can we talk about it? I mean, do we have do we have do we actually have contracts signed? Are we do we have uh, you know pen to paper, uh, money moved, uh, funds verified, all that stuff? If so, how many? Yeah, so we haven't. We will be disclosing that in the coming, probably over the next um, uh, two to four weeks. So I can't. <laughs> the timing right now, I can't you ask. <laughs> but it, but it's a good question and it's a fair question. And every shareholder we but, have. But there, but, but there are, but there are some. I mean, that's what oh, absolutely. No, no, it's it, yeah, no, it's real, and it's uh, and it's the the response, the global response has been fascinating for us. Like interest from 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 countries that I didn't even think um, would show up for a number of years. Uh, there's there's so much initiative and and food security. I mean, we don't feel it so much in North America in the same way that many many other parts of the world do. Uh, and there's so much more vulnerability to um, um, to food supply. So uh, again, lots and lots of interest coming in from um, the continent of Africa, for instance, and and throughout Europe. And of course, Europe has been suffering dramatically because of the the war in Ukraine and and uh, supply of of natural gas specifically, but also um, fertilizer supply, um, most of which comes from Ukraine and Russia. Uh, interestingly, uh, is, has all but uh, has all but dried up. So that means that yields go down dramatically, cost goes up dramatically, uh, and and food insecurity is is rampant globally. We haven't even seen the tip of it yet, and the next year uh, will be very um, quite I think quite shocking and dramatic in that context, and and a big eye opener as well. And this is why again trying to get technology like ours out there that stabilizes and protects those extreme variable um variable systems i think is so important um and and yeah and again that's uh, that's why the interest i think is as high as it is today uh because there's such an acute there's there's really a spotlight on the need today and um uh, which is great timing for us but um but sad in the context of what's happening in the world obviously well, man, I appreciate you. I appreciate what your company's doing, and and uh, and I appreciate what you've uh, done in the past. And 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 I feel good about the future, knowing that there are people like you uh, that 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 are passionate about it, that that see that there's a challenge, and you're out there trying to do something about it. This is what you know. We've had this podcast now going on nine years, and I just love bringing people on uh, from all walks of life, different types of businesses, and but more importantly, people that are real people that are doing real stuff, and that's exactly who you are. That's exactly who, who the company is. Fuel positive. Again, folks, um, if you're concerned about the world, if you're concerned about your children's future or your children's children's future, and, and you want to do something about it, you want to learn a little bit about it, you can just go to fuelpositive.com. They got a bunch of information on there, not necessarily even just about their company, but, but just what's happening uh, in the world. Because again, I, earlier I had you know talked about, I, I, you know, I, I'm somewhat confused about what's working, the things that I should do or things that I, that I shouldn't do. Uh, what Ian and his company are doing, they're doing, they're doing big things uh, that ultimately will have a big impact uh, long term. But like you said earlier, sometimes this stuff just takes time. Uh, and I feel like we're at the point where he's at a kind of a, at, at a tipping point right now where, where things are really going to start to ramp up. So if you'd like some more information, you can go to fuelpositive.com. Uh, you can just Google them. I believe they got some videos out there to show you a little bit about how it's working. My name is Mike Alden. That's Ian Clifford. And we'll see you soon. I'm super excited about our latest program. Look, we've been on television for close to 20 years, literally selling hundreds of millions of dollars with products and services that have had a positive impact on people's lives. We've created 
millionaires. If you've ever watched television, you've most likely seen me on television, not dressed like this, but in a suit and a tie. Listen, we've re-engineered the process. We're allowing people, a small group of people, whether you're an author, whether you're a business coach, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you have a program or a service that you feel as though that can have a positive impact on people's lives and you want to up-level your game, you know, you're tired of what's going on on social media, you're tired of AI is not kicking in, you're tired of all the money that you're spent and you're not seeing any return, you're tired of all these fraudsters out there that tell you they're going to put you in Huffington Post or USA Today or Forbes and it's nothing just but a joke. You want to be in front of millions of people every single day all over the country? Folks, we've been doing it for 20 years. We've re-engineered the process. We've made it possible for the average everyday person to participate in this. If you want to up-level your game, if you truly want to build your profile, if you truly want to get in front of millions of people every single day, send me a direct message at MikeAlden2012. You'll see it on the bottom of the screen at Mike Alden 2012 and put TV in the message and I will get back to you personally and see if you're a good fit for us. Again, send me a direct message at Mike Alden 2012. Send me the message TV and we'll see if you're a good fit.